Hello, welcome back to the Vantage Seminar. And today we are uh, very happy to be hosting Anna Kariani, who will be speaking on modularity over CM fields. And this is the last talk in the series of talks in memory of Bas Edixhoven. So uh, Anna, is it all right for us to video this talk today? Yes. Wonderful. And um, as you're watching, feel free to ask any questions that, that you might have. All right, please go ahead. All right, well, um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak in this series. And I'm really uh, glad that there is a series of talks in memory of uh, Bas Edixhoven. Um, I didn't know him well, but um, every time that I interacted with him at conferences, he was just nice and friendly and approachable, and it really made a difference to the atmosphere. And I'm sure there are many people in the number theory community who miss him. Um, and I guess in terms of his mathematics, he, um, he had a lot of impact on, um, say, questions to do with the geometry of modular curves and um, maybe computational aspects of uh, modular forms and Galois representations. And as is also linked on, on the page for the seminar, he wrote a beautiful survey on the modularity of elliptic curves over the rational numbers. And so um, I guess, yeah, these topics are going to make an appearance in my talk today. And so I want to start um, by talking about the modularity of elliptic curves over the rational numbers. And then I want to talk about, say, what can be done um, over quadratic fields, first real quadratic fields, and then imaginary quadratic fields. And I guess the, ah, sorry. The, the part of the talk that is new uh, is joint work in progress with James Newton. So I'm gonna recall modularity of elliptic curves over the rational numbers. So let E, over Q be an elliptic curve, which means um, a smooth projective curve of genus one together with a preferred point. Um, and it can be represented um, in the affine plane by a cubic equation. Then E is modular. And what this is going to mean for us in this talk is that there exists a modular form F, which is a cusp form of weight two and level gamma zero N, which is also an eigen form for the Hecke operators uh, that say are prime to N and such that there you sort of, you have the following equality of data. So AP of F is equal to AP of E for all primes P that do not divide N. So here, this is P plus one minus the number of points of the elliptic curve if we view it as a curve over um, the finite field with P elements. And this is the eigenvalue of the Heck operator TP acting on F because F is assumed to be a Heck eigenform. Um, it's a simultaneous eigenvector for all of these eigenvalues and uh, for, for all of these Heck operators. And we keep track of the eigenvalues. And explicitly the modularity of elliptic curves can be phrased as um, this equality for all but finitely many primes. The primes that we're excluding are the so-called bad primes. Those would be primes where, for instance, our elliptic curve would have bad reduction or um, on the modular form side, there are primes that divide the level N of the modular form. And I should say there are sort of, uh, there's another way to think about modularity, which is that um, sort of in this setting of um, 
elliptic curves over the rational numbers and modular forms, you can express modularity um, as saying that uh, there is a quotient of the Jacobian of the corresponding modular curve of level gamma zero n, which is isomorphic or uh, maybe isogenous uh, to the elliptic curve that we're trying to understand. Um, so there's kind of a geometric way to think about modularity in this setting. Uh, but from the point of view of what uh, might generalize to real quadratic fields um, or to imaginary quadratic fields or even to more general number fields, the most that we can expect um, is that we can sort of match this kind of data. Um, so on one hand, the sequence of AP that you extract from the elliptic curve by counting points over finite fields, and on the other hand, uh, the Hecke eigenvalues um, on the side of the modular form or automorphic form. And I should say that this is also sort of, um, since the series is about Galois representation, this uh, explicit relation can be obtained um, from saying that the associated Galois representations are isomorphic. So you can associate a Galois representation to F and sort of in a more sophisticated way, you can phrase this modularity as saying that the Galois representation associated to F is isomorphic to the Galois representation that you see on the Tate module of the elliptic curve. Uh, let's say here GL2QL. Maybe these are elatic Galois representations. Okay, so something like this. Um, I want to kind of mention an outline for how this theorem is proved in four steps. And then I'll say what um, sort of can be done about each step in different settings. Ah, and of course, this theorem was sort of originated in work of Wiles and Taylor Wiles, who proved the modularity of elliptic curves uh, that are semi-stable. Um, and that was more than 25 years ago. And then it was completed uh, for all elliptic curves in work of Roy, Conrad, Diamond, and Taylor. And that was more than 20 years ago now. So the first thing is to prove a modularity lifting theorem. Which means that you look at the residual Galois representation ah, associated to E. And you assume that this is modular and has large enough image. Then, so you consider this, you assume this, and then you prove that the characteristic zero representation is modular. So you assume um, that the mod P, uh, just the reduction mod P of the Galois representation associated to your elliptic curve um, is a reduction of the Galois representation coming from some um, cusp form of weight two that is an eigenform for all the heck operators. And then you want to prove um, in some way that even the characteristic zero lift of this representation that you see in the Tate module of the elliptic curve comes from, again, a cusp form of weight two that is a heck eigenform. And this is via the so-called Taylor-Wiles method or Taylor Wiles patching.
So this is sort of a way of viewing your um, um, all the Galois representations that lift your particular residual Galois representation as a family. You view them actually over, over a local deformation ring, and you compare this to a family that comes from modular forms. Anyway, but this is the so-called Taylor-Wiles method that proves a modularity lifting theorem. Then the next step is um, you apply this in the case where P equals three. And in that case, um, maybe you can actually show that your residual representation, so your mod three representation is modular. Because remember, that's part of the assumptions. You want it to be modular and you want it to have large image. So if P is three, one can show that rho bar E3 that's valued in GL2 F3 is modular. If, um, right, so this is because this is solvable and admits a faithful uh, two dimensional complex representation. And so Artin's conjecture would predict that um, there is a weight one modular form attached to uh, such a representation. And in this case, in the solvable case, there's a theorem due to Langlands and Tunnel that actually gives you this weight one modular form. So Langlands Tunnel theorem using the solvability um, gives modularity. And there's a subtlety here, namely that Langland's tunnel theorem um, gives you a priori just a modular form of weight one, and we're looking for a modular form of weight two. And so one needs to produce a congruence from weight one to weight two. And that's something that can be done in this setting. All right. Um, so steps one and two together are promising, um, but I guess you don't just need to know that the residual representation is modular to apply your modularity lifting theorem. We also need this large image assumption. And um, well, you can't always guarantee this. So then the next thing one can do is there's a three five modularity switch. Um, this is going to prove that rho bar E5, so the mod 5 representation attached to our elliptic curve, is modular by finding um, an E prime, a different elliptic curve over Q such that you have an isomorphism on the level of the five torsion between the one that you see on E and the one that you see on E prime. And so as representations of the absolute Galois group of Q and um, E prime three has large image. So because if, if you can do this, um, if the Galois representation on the three torsion has large image, so this would be, yeah, this would be rho bar E prime three, um, then you know it's modular by Langlands tunnel, and then you apply the modularity lifting theorem in step one to show that E prime is modular. And then this is going to tell you that the mod five representation attached to E prime is also modular. So then the mod five representation that you see on E is modular. So this kind of gives you another way of proving modularity of E if you know um, that now the five torsion, the Galois representation that you see on the five torsion of your original elliptic curve is large. So steps one, two, and three uh, are going to give you modularity if you know that either um, what you see on the three torsion is large or what you see on the five torsion is large. And you can apply modularity lifting with P equals three or P equals five. 
the way that you find this, by the way, is um, you, so in order to find this E prime, you um, produce rational points on a twist of the modular curve, ah, E, X, E, on a twist of the modular curve with full level structure at five. This turns out to have a rational point and it's a genus one curve. So this is isomorphic to P1. And so it has lots of rational points and the Hilbert um, irreducibility theorem guarantees that you can find a rational point where the sort of condition that the three torsion has large image is satisfied. So this is step three. And then step four is to understand the exceptions. So the exceptions are if sort of both row bar E3 and row bar E5 have, let's say, small image. So just whatever your large image assumption is, some, something that fails both mod three and mod five. So um, it turns out, for example, if they are both reducible, then E um, gives rise to a rational point in X not 15. So if, if both of these Galois representations are reducible, that means you have a line inside the three torsion and a line inside the five torsion. So that it's exactly something that's parameterized by the modular curve with level gamma zero 15. Um, and because this is all Galois stable, it's a rational point there. Now this uh, X not 15 is actually an elliptic curve. One can find an explicit equation for this. It's an elliptic curve with a uh, more Delve rank zero. So that means it has finitely many rational points. And in fact, uh, it turns out it has eight rational points. Four of these are cusps. Um, the other four correspond to elliptic curves that are isogenous. And this reduces you to just show that, you know, there's one exception, one elliptic curve that you need to show is modular. Um, and this has small conductor, I forget now, but it's under 100. So these days you could just look it up in the modular forms and elliptic curves database and you could see there is a modular form associated to it. Uh, so there's sort of eight points, but only four corresponding to elliptic curves and so on. All right, so this is sort of a sketch of um, how one proves modularity of elliptic curves over the rational numbers. So now one can ask, you know, what happens if you change your base field? And instead of looking at elliptic curves over the rationals, you look at elliptic curves over more general number fields. And it turns out, so in this level of generality, the question is wide open. Um, there has been in the past, say 15 years, there's been progress, a lot of progress uh, for certain sort of special number fields, in particular quadratic, uh, real quadratic fields. So let me state the second result that I want to discuss. Um, so this is um, due to Freitas, Lehung, and Siksek. And this is from uh, 2013, I think. So about 10 years ago. Uh, let F be a real quadratic field. So you obtain it by joining the square root of some uh, positive integer, square free. Uh, and let E over F be an elliptic curve. Then it's modular. And here it's a little bit so the question is, what does it mean that it's modular? 
And maybe I won't say it super precisely, but that there exists a Hilbert modular form of parallel weight two, which is sort of has the right um, system of Heck eigenvalues. And just to comment on something, so a modular form here is a, is a function, a holomorphic function on the upper half plane quotiented out by a congruent subgroup. In this case, we took the congruent subgroup gamma zero n. Um, over here, this is going to be a function on, you have two copies of H and you quotient out by gamma, where gamma is some congruent subgroup contained inside SL2OF. And in fact, um, the perspective that we want to take um, is rather than thinking about uh, modular forms or Hilbert modular forms or more general automorphic forms as uh, functions on this kind of a locally symmetric space, we want to think of just the system of eigenvalues that contributes to the cohomology of the space with constant coefficients. So this is something that will contribute by some generalization of uh, the eichler shimura relation so let me just mark here, contributes to um, H, I guess in this case, it will be the middle degree, H2, H cross H mod gamma and with constant coefficients. So it's the theorem in this case says that, um, you know, you can form the sequence of APs from your elliptic curve and these show up as a system of Hecke eigenvalues in the cohomology of this uh, Hilbert modular surface that is uh, a quotient of two copies of the upper half plane uh, by a congruent subgroup contained inside SL2OF. All right, and I wanna say a word about how they prove this theorem. And maybe I can just add to the outline. So one needs to prove a modularity lifting theorem. And of course, now your Galois representations, because your elliptic curve is defined over F, you have a representation of the absolute Galois group of F, um, a still a uh, sort of a mod P representation. Um, and you still want to prove a modularity lifting theorem. And in this case, it turns out it's very convenient um, to, and, and in fact, you need um, to use Kissin's approach to proving modularity lifting theorems. So uh, sort of one of the key ideas that he introduced is to really, um, when you do this kind of Taylor-Wiles patching, is to really work over um, the local deformation uh, ring for your residual Galois representation, but that has some piadic Hodge theoretic conditions at P. And that somehow the geometry of that local deformation ring controls uh, whether you are able to prove uh, your modularity lifting theorem. And so in this particular case where you're trying to lift the Galois representation that you see, or you're, you know, you're trying to prove mo modularity lifting for something that occurs in the Tate module of an elliptic curve, the right piadic Hodge theoretic condition is um, sort of called Barsotti Tate or maybe crystalline with um, Hodge Tate weights zero and one. So it's, it's sort of one of the nicest possible cases. So crystalline would be kind of the, the piadic version of unramified in some sense. So, so sort of as nice as possible and with these uh, very particular Hodge Tate weights. So this is works in the Barsotti Tate case. And this means crystalline um, with Hodge Tate weight zero one. 
And it turns out that the, the local deformation ring in this case looks very nice. Um, it essentially has um, its generic fiber will have two components. Uh, there will be a component that sees ordinary Galois representations and a component that sees um, non-ordinary crystalline representations. And, and the fact that sort of this deformation ring is very nice and has only these two components that are well understood is important for proving modularity lifting in this setting. Okay, um, so that's what I can say about modularity lifting. Uh, about residual uh, modularity, one still uses the Langlands tunnel theorem and one still needs to produce the congruence to get to parallel weight two, and that's okay. Um, one can still do a 3-5 modularity switch in this setting in essentially the same way, um, but it turns out this isn't quite enough to prove modularity of all elliptic curves over real quadratic fields, so then they also do a 3-7 modularity switch. So the same idea, but sort of proving the modularity of a mod 7 um, Galois representation. And I guess the key thing is here that you want to understand a twist of the modular curve with full level seven. And this is a twist of the Klein cortic. So it's a genus three curve. So it's more complicated and it's harder to produce, uh, for instance, quadratic points on it or like points valued in a particular real quadratic field. So the argument that is in this setting is more subtle. and it's harder to produce the right points, but they do it. So Freitas, Lehung, and Sixek. And then understanding exceptions. Um, well, here there's a subtlety. So, so you have an elliptic curve over the rational numbers, which is this X0, 15, which has more del V rank zero. It turns out there's a conjecture of Goldfeld uh, that says that if you sort of base change this elliptic curve to a sort of random quadratic field, uh, then you expect that this will have rank zero 50% of the time and rank one 50% of the time. And so that means that, you know, 50% of the time there's going to be infinitely many um, points, infinitely many quadratic points on this elliptic curve. Um, so understanding exceptions is also more subtle, but that's why they have this 3-7 modularity switch. And um, sort of because of this, they, they managed to sort of consider a series of modular curves with kind of very special levels at three, at five, and at seven. And it turns out that they all have genus greater than one. So exceptions are all points, points on modular curves of genus greater than one. And they analyze all of these modular curves. Uh, by uh, Fulton's theorem, if, if the curve has genus greater than one and you look at it over a fixed um, number field, then it has only uh, finitely many points. So you know that for any fixed real quadratic field, there will be finitely many exceptions just by doing a genus computation. Okay, uh, and then they, they actually analyze them and understand all the real quadratic points on these curves, and they're able to show that all the exceptions are also modular. So it's the same structure of the argument, but more involved. Uh, Anna, sorry to interrupt yeah. you for a minute. Uh, could you just repeat your last remark about um, uh, X is seven. Uh, somebody just wanted to understand that a little better. Yeah, so this is a twist of the Klein quartic. I guess X seven is the Klein quartic. Um, and in order to do this three seven modularity switch, you you know ideally you would want to say that it's easy to produce um, points on X e seven, right? Points valued in your particular real quadratic field. And, but because this is a genus three curve, you can't just directly apply Hilbert irreducibility and say, oh, we have tons of points. Uh, but what they do instead is they intersect this with uh, lines 
and sort of the, the you have an equation of degree four, you intersect it with a line. So, so you produce points in um, degree four extension of your original real quadratic field. Uh, and so they still use Hilbert irreducibility, but for some more sophisticated space that you get by considering intersections of a varying line with this Klein quartic. And then the nice thing is that degree four fields, um, I mean, degree four extensions are solvable. So if you prove modularity over such an extension, then that's something that you can still descend to your original real quadratic field that you were interested in. Um, yeah, I'll come back to this in a second. So let's see. I'm just trying to remember if there's something else I want to say before I move on. Right. Um, so I want to say what one can do over imaginary quadratic fields. And here there's really a, a qualitative difference. So let me just say if F over Q is an imaginary quadratic field. Oh, I should say also that this freitas lehung sixek paper is really nicely written. And so if you want to see what more details about this X E of seven, just look at the paper. Um, so if F over Q is an imaginary quadratic field, then uh, sort of there is a qualitative difference which is that we want to understand H, I mean, H1 or H2 um, of X gamma with constant coefficients where X gamma is, can, is roughly a quotient of hyperbolic three space by a congruent subgroup contained inside SL2OF. So the, this is the corresponding locally symmetric space in whose cohomology uh, you expect to see the system of Hecke eigenvalues that would be associated to your elliptic curve over this imaginary quadratic field. And so the, the qualitative difference is that this doesn't have a complex structure in a, and so it doesn't have the structure of an algebraic variety either in any natural way. And so in, in the modular curve case, modular curves are algebraic curves. In the Hilbert case, um, you, we were looking at Hilbert modular surfaces, which are algebraic surfaces. And somehow, even just to kind of construct the Galois representations attached to modular forms or Hilbert modular forms, you use this algebraic structure because you look in the et al cohomology of these algebraic varieties. And um, in this case, where you're trying to understand the imaginary quadratic field case, there is, um, there's no natural way to, to put an algebraic structure on the space that you're trying to understand. And so you cannot access its et al cohomology and it's much harder to access uh, the Galois representations attached to your automorphic forms. So it's, it's harder to even set up this Taylor-Wiles method. Um, right, so sort of here I'll just say that it has no algebraic structure. And this relates to a development in the field that's been going on I don't know, for the past 10 years or a, a bit over 10 years. Um, so first of all, I guess in this very special case, one did have um, Gawa representations by work of maybe Harris, Sudri and Taylor. Um, in, in even more general settings, um, looking at the cohomology of these kinds of locally symmetric spaces that come from CM fields, um, one has the desired Galois representations by work of Harris, Land, Taylor, and Thorne. Uh, this is from, I think, 2012. And then also um, Galois representations for the torsion in the cohomology of these spaces, they also exist by work of Schultze. So in this case, because of this qualitative difference, the existence of Galois representations is more subtle.
Uh, so here there's work of, let me just say, Harris, Lan, Taylor, and Thorn, and also Schultz. Uh, that also applies to torsion. So this would apply to H1, X gamma, with coefficients in FP, where there may be classes that don't lift to characteristic zero. Okay, um, so that's one thing. But still, in this case, it turns out one can make some progress on modularity of elliptic curves. And let me just state, so I mean that various people have done work on this and I'll, I'll mention this, but I wanna state the theorem that James and I have that's work in progress. And then I'll discuss previous results as well. So F is imaginary quadratic. E is an elliptic curve over F and it's non-CM. So it doesn't have complex multiplication. This is, you know, a non-trivial condition to put in this setting um, because uh, otherwise the associated Galois representation could be reducible. And in that case, you know, we, we understand things a lot better um, because of global class field theory. So this is sort of the interesting case. And then we have a hypothesis So if P is equal to three or five, the action, we're assuming this, that the action of the absolute Galois group of F, uh, but just restricted to F zeta P, where I'm adding uh, the P root of unity to F uh, on, yeah, uh, the action of this, um, on, I guess, EP is absolutely irreducible. So under this assumption, we can show that E is modular. Okay, um, so, and, and this follows the outline um, that I described over the rational numbers, except um, somehow for now only steps one, two, and three. So I guess one thing to say here is you want to prove a modularity lifting theorem. And so for this, I'm going to add in blue the imaginary quadratic case. So I mentioned this Taylor Wiles Kissin style patching. Um, one needs to use a different technique when you're working over an imaginary quadratic field. One needs to use sort of the so-called caligari garrity enhancement of this method. And this has to do with um, the qualitative difference that I mentioned, um, and also with the existence of torsion in the cohomology of the arithmetic hyperbolic three manifolds that we're looking at. So we're proving a modularity lifting theorem using the caligari garrity method, which is kind of a, an enhancement of the taylor wiles method. And locally at the prime P where we're trying to do the modularity lifting, um, we are sort of putting ourselves in the same setting as in Kissin's theorem. Um, so this kind of Barsotti tate case where at P you are crystalline and with Hodge tate weight zero one, and you know that the local deformation ring looks very nice. And that's something local, so it doesn't, doesn't care whether you're over a real quadratic field or over an imaginary quadratic field. So, right, so step one is we prove a modularity lifting theorem like this. Um, step two is residual modularity. This is actually much more subtle in this case, um, but, this is provided by a theorem of Allen, Kare, and Thorne from 2019. So let me just write here for these. This is for both sort of a mod three and mod five residual modularity. 
So it turns out that this kind of producing congruences um, to automorphic forms of parallel weight two. So this, um, this part that I have in, in parentheses here, this is more subtle uh, when you're working uh, over an imaginary quadratic field or more generally over a CM field. Um, it's, it's harder to produce congruences. And so instead of uh, using the Langlands tunnel theorem, they actually prove um, modularity for the mod two Galois representation, uh, which is assumed to satisfy some special conditions. And then they use a two, three and two, five um, switch in order to prove the modularity of many residual Galois representations. And I guess the many residual Galois representations can be sort of, yeah, that, that can be applied to what we see on the three torsion or the five torsion of the elliptic curve that we're looking at. So, right, so steps one, two, and three can be implemented. And then that leaves us with understanding exceptions and so we have this hypothesis H in our theorem. The question is, okay, what about the, the elliptic curves that don't satisfy this? You know, can we somehow classify them and understand what happens to them? And the answer is, well, it's not so easy because this X0 15, this elliptic curve of rank zero over the rational numbers can still get rank one over many imaginary quadratic fields. And another important thing to say is that somehow we're not able, so far we weren't able to do, um, in this case, we were not able to do the um, three seven switch. Right, um, but one can still sort of understand exceptions when the base change of X0 15 to your imaginary quadratic field has rank zero. And we're very optimistic that we'll be able to do this. So let me put all of this down as a remark. So, uh, and before that, just to give you some sense for this hypothesis, there's a paper of David Zuina that shows for a fixed imaginary quadratic field F or number field F, hypothesis H is satisfied by 100% of elliptic curves. Uh, where the ordering is by uh, the naive height of the Weierstrass equation. And then the second remark is that we hope to prove modularity of all elliptic curves, ah, F uh, or all E over F when F is such that X0 15 has more del V rank um, zero over F. And so by Goldfeld's conjecture, 50% of imaginary quadratic fields are expected to satisfy this. And in particular, this would apply to Q adjoined I, Q adjoined square root minus two, Q adjoined square root minus three. Okay, and we hope to do this by understanding exceptions and understanding um, the imaginary quadratic points on some number of modular curves. And we've understood some number of them and we have a kind of, I think, two left um, where we have to analyze all the imaginary quadratic points. Okay, um, so that's another thing to say. And then also sort of previous results So Alan, Carr, and Thorne, I mentioned their uh, residual modularity result. 
they prove actual modularity for uh, a positive proportion of elliptic curves, in fact, over a general CM field. Modularity of a positive proportion. Basically, they prove modularity with an ordinary condition at three or at five. And more recently, there was on the archive a paper of Dmitry Whitmore, who proved modularity of a positive proportion of elliptic curves over any quadratic extension of a totally real field. So that's more general than a CM field. Um, and that's something that we don't know how to do. One uh, comment that I wanna make here is that this sort of refines a technique of Boxer, Caligari, G and Piloni, um, who are more sort of interested and understanding, uh, I guess, potential modularity of abelian surfaces. And their theorem also proves potential modularity of um, elliptic curves over qu any quadratic extension of a totally real field. Um, this also relies on, on this caligari garrity method that I mentioned, but somehow the, the difference is that they work with um, the coherent cohomology of certain Shimura varieties, whereas we work with the Betty cohomology of locally or yeah, with the singular cohomology or Betty cohomology of locally symmetric spaces. Um, right. And in my remaining time, I think these are the remarks I wanted to make. So in, in my remaining time, I want to um, sort of mention some of the ideas that go in this work in progress with James. So one sort of key idea is um, proving local global compatibility in the crystalline case for uh, the Galois representations constructed by Schultz. So roughly, um, this means that when you wanna implement your, your patching method, well, let's say the Galois-Garrity version of it, you want to know that your Galois representations live over this particularly nice deformation ring with these piatic Hodge theoretic conditions at P. And that's something that's not guaranteed. Um, and in fact, it's quite subtle um, to prove when you consider Galois representations attached to torsion in the cohomology of locally symmetric spaces. So maybe I don't have so much time to go into details here. Maybe I can just answer questions if somebody has questions, but sort of we introduce a new technique um, that sort of combines ideas from the so-called 10 author paper. It's another paper on uh, potential modularity over CM fields with uh, taking P ordinary parts. So it's sort of working in a certain kind of HEDA family, uh, but one uh, that is specifically associated to a parabolic subgroup of the group that you're interested in. Uh, um, so for instance, GL2 over our imaginary quadratic field, you should think of this as a levy inside um, Ziegel parabolic 
P of a larger unitary group um, that is U22. And the way that one understands torsion in the cohomology of these locally symmetric spaces is by relating them to the cohomology of Shimura varieties attached to the larger group, so this larger unitary group. And somehow it it's, turns out that it's important um, to work with the p ordinary part of cohomology there, uh, where p is the Ziegel parabolic. So it's the one with um, two two by two blocks. Um, one another comment that I want to make about this local global compatibility is that we actually work with GLN rather than GL2 over a general CM field. In fact, we can't quite do this imaginary quadratic case, but we can do more general CM fields. And um, we work with sort of arbitrary Hodge Tate weights. And uh, my PhD student, Ben Zehevesi, is working on extending this uh, theorem also to the potentially semi stable case. So Hopefully in the near future, these kind of piatic Hodge theoretic properties of these Galois representations will be well understood. And this is really a crucial ingredient in proving a modularity lifting theorem. So let me just yeah, kind of emphasize this. So this is something that's crucial for proving a Kissin style modularity lifting theorem in this setting. Um, so that's something that wasn't available before. Um, and another, well, another key idea, maybe, maybe this one is really just, uh, I'll just say something that's kind of technical. And then if somebody has questions about it, then I can answer it, but a refined, um, degree shifting. at auxiliary primes that works in the ramified case. Okay, but so this gives you a modularity lifting theorem. I mentioned the residual modularity of Alan Carr and Thorne. So maybe I just wanna end by saying sort of how to understand the exceptions. So if you want to eventually prove modularity of all elliptic curves, say over the Gaussian numbers, then you have to understand certain exceptions. And so for example, they, they live on uh, modular curves with small level. And especially since this um, series of talks is dedicated to Bas Eddigshoven and he's made so many contributions on the geometry of such modular curves, I want to mention this one example. Um, so you could, for instance, look at a modular curve with a level at three that is given by uh, the non-split Cartan and a level at five given by the Borel. So here you're looking at elliptic curves such that the image of rho bar E3 um, is contained in a non-split Cartan. This is a certain subgroup of GL2F3. And here the image of rho bar E5 is contained inside the Borel. Of GL2F5. It turns out, okay, so um, this is a particular elliptic curve with a somewhat exotic small level at three and five. Uh, let me call this C. Turns out it's possible to find an equation for this. Um, it turns out to be y squared is minus three x to the fourth plus two x cubed minus x squared plus 10 x plus 25. 
the way you find these equations is because sometimes you can write down um, explicit formulas for the J invariant, um, say for the modular curve with level given by non-split Cartan at three and modular curve with Borel at five. And then you just take a fiber product and the normalizations. Um, this is a genus one curve, but it has no rational points. So it's not an elliptic curve. Um, in, what this means is that um, you have an injection between uh, pick zero of this curve, if you look at the rational points, so um, rational divisors on your curve inject into the Q points of the Jacobian. You can compute the Jacobian. This is an elliptic curve with more del Vey rank zero. The Q points are Z mod 2Z cross Z mod 2Z. And it's possible to compute that this is exactly Z mod 2Z. So there are two um, rational divisors. So if you try to understand uh, imaginary quadratic points on this curve, then they're going to be given by or they're going to give rise to rational divisors of this form, right? The, these, and this can be where sigma is the non-trivial element in the Gallo group. Right, um, so this can be the trivial class. It turns out in that case that J invariant uh, of the elliptic curve is rational. So you know modularity. That's because um, the J invariant is sort of factors through the map from the curve that just uh, sends X, Y to X. And when you look at the trivial um, divisor class in there, X is always rational. And so that tells you the J invariant is also rational. And then, trivial class, the funny thing happened is that for this point, x sigma can be computed to always equal five. And this kind of x goes to five over x turns out to also be the atkin laner involution at five. And so this tells you that p and p sigma uh, represent isogenous elliptic curves. So this tells you um, that your original curve, E, uh, is a Q curve. And that's something that we again know is modular. So for this particular small lever modular curve, you can use these kind of computational techniques and, and these symmetries, these atkin laner involutions um, to show that all the imaginary quadratic points on the curve are modular. And so now we're in the process of analyzing a bunch of other small lever modular curves like this. And thank you very much for your attention. Happy to answer questions.